Professor Dronowski, who will be the next uh, speaker. Uh, Professor Dronowski, of course, is internationally well known, especially on his work lately on socioeconomic determinants of food choice and preference. Professor Dronowski. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Adam Dronowski. I'm professor of epidemiology at the University of Washington School of Public Health. And I want to talk to you about social disparities and obesity. What I like about the POD is that it does give the obesity epidemic a sense of place. The obese people that we talk about don't live someplace on a Microsoft cloud. They live in real neighborhoods. And a POD is a very granular approach that talks about involving parents and schools and policymakers and local politicians. And the effects of the environment, in fact, are very important. This being a discussion, I'm going to permit myself some provocative points uh, to better um, have an interesting discussion later on. Sometimes we underestimate the impact of socioeconomic factors on obesity. And in fact, many of the data that we have at state level or country level minimize or mask the importance of socioeconomic factors. So whenever we look at the admittedly excellent maps provided by the CDC, we are drawn to such questions as, is Colorado still blue? Are the rates of obesity higher in Mississippi than they are in Massachusetts? I propose to you that those are not the right questions we absolutely have to look at the local level exactly as a POD does. Because when in Seattle we do look at obesity at the local level, and by local level I mean census tract level, each census tract is 4,000 people, we are struck that there are huge local disparities in obesity rates where areas with low obesity and high obesity are separated from each other by a couple of miles. So you may say that people with genetic deficits or genetic vulnerability all moved to South Seattle. But you also have to admit that environment may have played a part. So these are, in fact, unique data for 60,000 people in Seattle King County. And what you see is obesity rates by census tract. You see that areas near the lake, waterfront, Mercer Island, all the areas around Microsoft, obesity rates are very low, and a lot of the obesity is concentrated in South County. As I say, those are data for 60,000 people. They are based on a diagnosis of obesity, diabetes, or metabolic syndrome, and of course they come from a health maintenance organizations. I'm saying this because you have such data where you are, you just have not looked at them that way. And let me take you bit further. We can now start looking at obesity at the individual level. For the past several years, I have been running the Seattle Obesity Study funded by the National Institutes of Health. It is based on a stratified random sample of 2,000 adult residents of King County. The participants completed a 25-minute telephone interview, very much based on the behavioral risk factor surveillance system. But we had one more thing. We had their addresses, the addresses of their home and their work, and also addresses of the supermarkets they shopped at. The primary grocery stores were listed by name, chain name, and also by the exact location. And we also went ahead and sampled the prices of a market basket of food at each of the major supermarket chains. And so here, our maps are showing that we know exactly where our respondents live, that's the blue dots. We know exactly where our obese respondents live, that's the red dots. We actually use some interesting novel techniques, uh, coronal density analysis, to plot areas with high obesity rates with no geographic boundaries. We have now gone beyond countries and beyond states and beyond even census tracts. We plot disproportionately high obesity rates by location. And what you see here 
is a connection that we are making between high obesity hotspots in King County and a deprivation index, which is based on socioeconomic conditions of neighborhoods from the census data. But I'm gonna pose another question to you. What is the one single variable that tells you pretty much everything that you want to know about a given neighborhood? Because we have looked at communities, we have looked at density of fast foods, density of bars and liquor stores and convenience stores and so on, and we also looked at proximity to parks and trails and recreational facilities and restaurants and cafes, and we say these are obesogenic neighborhoods and those are not obesogenic neighborhoods and perhaps we ought to be changing the obesogenic ones into the non-obesogenic ones. But what is the one variable that tells you everything that you want to know? And you're probably thinking the same thing I am because residential property values tell you absolutely everything you want to know. Everything. Because desirable neighborhoods are in fact more expensive and everything that is non-obesogenic can turn out to be more expensive. So what we actually do is we go to the Seattle King County Tax Assessor Database. We have access to the tax data. We have addresses of our respondents. And we can calculate not only the value of their own home, but we can also calculate the value of the properties within 10 minute walking distance. So the entire Seattle space is divided into a grid of 30 meters square. The computer travels and calculates property values within 10 minute walk, moves 30 yards down the road, recalculates it, does it six million times, and we get a nice property values vector for each location in the Seattle space. This is actually a procedure that we borrowed from the World Bank and can be applied outside Seattle to other places. You can do it as well. And then we calculate smart maps for wealth. This is the residential wealth contours for King County. The green areas are the non-obesogenic areas with the trails and parks and mature trees and aesthetics. And the red areas are the areas with more fast foods, more convenience stores, more freeways, more traffic, more noise, and so on. And everything is absolutely reflected in property values. And it is not surprising that, of course, lower house prices are a perfect predictor of obesity in women. Not so much men, that's a bit of a puzzle, but women, absolutely. The odds ratio is 3.4 after adjusting for individual education and incomes, and for women it is actually better to own than to rent uh, because obesity values again vary as a function of this measure of socioeconomic status. This measure of socioeconomic status is actually a very good measure of wealth and accumulated assets as opposed to day-to-day -day income. Again, consider here that the difference in odds ratios is 3.4, and that is 300% difference. The difference by socioeconomic status, property values, are actually much greater than the difference in obesity rates by race, ethnicity, or by income. This paper was just recently published in Social Science and Medicine. Now the next issue that I want to move on to is the issue of shopping. Where you shop and what supermarket you go to may also have an impact on obesity rates. And here we were, to some extent, inspired by the food desert locator uh, produced by the US Department of Agriculture. And we're also able to geocode every single food source in King County. We get the data from Public Health Seattle King County. They license all the establishments allowed to sell food, so their data are really much better and much more up to date than the commercial data. We geocoded every single grocery store and remember, we knew exactly which particular grocery store our respondents went to. So of course, when you do the market basket study, you realize that not all supermarkets are equally affordable. One of the strategies of the US government has been to bring supermarkets to lower income areas in order to better serve underserved communities. But again, you've got to bring the right kind of supermarket to the right kind of neighborhood. Because here you will appreciate, for those of you who know the American situation, 
that Albertsons, Safeway, Kroger are cheaper than Metropolitan Market, PCC, or Whole Foods. Metropolitan Market and PCC are Seattle-based stores, but for example, in France, the equivalents would be Franc Prix and Monoprix, and the Produit Bio at the top end, and something like Aldi or the hard discount stores at the bottom end, with Carrefour probably someplace in the middle. So the same strategy and the same kind of hierarchy of prices does apply in Europe, and I'm convinced that we will get similar results in Europe. In fact, I already know that we do. So these are the prices for supermarkets. These are now demographics for supermarkets because some supermarkets attract clients of lower income and lower education. So when you look here, for example, it's Safeway in blue, you will see that the predominant number of consumers who go to Safeway is going to be lower education and lower income. And then we are somewhat surprised to see differences in obesity rates among Whole Foods shoppers and Safeway and Albertsons shoppers. Again, remember, the racial differences in obesity rates are between 20 to 50 percent. The differences in obesity rates by supermarket where you shop at were staggering. Here you go from 4 percent obesity rates among Whole Foods shoppers to 36 percent obesity rates among Albertsons shoppers. And that raises a number of very interesting questions. First of all, you have a paradox, because obviously fruits and vegetables at Safeway are much cheaper than they are at Whole Foods. And yet obesity rates among Safeway shoppers are six times higher than they are at Whole Foods. Huh. Then, I'm not insisting on causality here, of course Safeway and Albertsons do have fruits and vegetables and salads and low-fat milk and diet soft drinks and mineral waters and so on, and yet obesity rates are high. So again, economics cannot be the only explanation. You have to insist on nutrition education. You have to insist on some knowledge of healthy eating and healthy food purchases, but the two go together. And then, given that shopping at Safeway, since we're talking about policy interventions, since shopping at Safeway is associated with higher obesity rates, adjusting for individual level education and income, should there be, I'm being facetious here, an anti-obesity tax on shopping at Safeway to protect consumers from becoming obese? So to start wrapping up, there are also some interesting economic factors here. Because healthy diets, for the most part, such as they are consumed, tend to be more expensive. Now, I always get the argument that they don't have to be more expensive. And if people were to adopt different eating habits, healthy diets needn't be more expensive. But the way that we observe them, they are. Because what we do is we attach prices to already consumed diets. We go for big national data sets. We attach prices to them. And we say this diet of fresh fish and salads and lean meat is actually more expensive than a diet of potato chips and cookies and other energy dense foods, some of which are nutrient poor. So when we start doing that, and I'll just show you one little slide, uh, we find that when we attach prices to a food frequency questionnaire, we find that diets with higher nutrient content tend to be associated with higher prices. So that the recommended diets, the diets high in vitamin D and calcium and potassium and fiber and the vitamins and minerals and so on, tend to be more expensive than diets high in added sugars and trans fats and saturated fats and grains and so on, because that is the way that food prices work. Calories tend to be cheap. Nutrients tend to be more expensive. Going from an unhealthy diet to a healthy diet is going to be, to some extent, an economic decision. You have to have two things. You have to have the nutrition education, you have to have access to the right supermarket, and then you've got to be able to afford the prices once you step in through the door. So you have three things here. One is socioeconomic status where you live. Second, socioeconomic status where you shop. 
third socioeconomic status, the type of foods that you can afford. So generally, when you talk about those topics, we usually talk in terms of diet causing obesity with socioeconomic status and the built-in food environment being modifying effects. So normally when we do statistics, we try to connect diet with obesity, adjusting for the inconvenient covariates in between. And I want to change this model and start talking about this. Socioeconomic status is very, very important. I'm gonna finish here with just a slide of New York because we're in New York and there has been a controversy here about um, diets and beverages and so on. So I want to draw your attention to an underappreciated paper uh, by Tom Frieden, currently the um, commissioner of the uh, Centers for Disease Control, which looked at the demographics of soda consumption in New York some time ago. Um, and data from New York, of course, show that highest obesity rates are going to be in Harlem, Morningside Heights, Bronx, parts of Brooklyn, whereas the Upper East Side of Manhattan is gonna be both rich and thin. And in fact, there was a component to that study which wasn't published, and there was a map, in fact, of obesity rates and soda consumption in New York City, and you can see that the map, where you start looking at the geographic location of who is consuming what, where, is actually very telling, because if you have soda consumption, you have obesity, but all those areas are, of course, as well, poor. And the moment that you start taking the poverty and other factors out of consideration, the connection between diet and obesity, to a very large extent, disappears. And so this is actually the introduction to a new discipline. I call it spatial nutrition epidemiology, because you can see now not only who consumes what, but also where they live, where they shop, where their homes are, and what they do. So these are new technologies and new methods and metrics which can be totally exported out of the United States elsewhere. We're already doing some data analysis in Europe where we have a parallel study going on currently in Paris where we're looking at shopping patterns, property values, obesity rates, and in fact, I can tell you already, Paris and Seattle are not that different. So the new approach to obesity prevention, I think, is very much in the spirit of a pod. It does give you a granular way of looking at obesity, community by community, but what we need to do is to absolutely focus on socioeconomic status as the driver of the food environment and dietary choices and health. Thank you.